Hello everyone, welcome back to My Hero Academia Podfix. Today I'll be reading a one-shot entitled Chrysanthemum and Crabapple. This is a healer Izuku fic. Izuku has a healing quirk and he interns with Recovery Girl. I do like this fic a lot, however it does have some sad points, so keep in mind there are some trigger warnings in the description, but otherwise, I hope you guys enjoy this one. Izuku finished wrapping the girl's wrist, before he was prodding it gently and smiling at her. Looks like it's going to be a bit sore for a few days, but just make sure to keep weight off it while it heals. You're lucky it wasn't a fracture. She gave him a nod and a wave before she was hopping off the examination bed, leaving Izuku to clean up the mess. It wasn't really much, really, just tearing off some paper and wiping it before replacing it with a new one, but the work was calming, enough to settle his mind after seeing injuries. Kind of sucks, having a healing quirk, but also being deathly afraid of blood and other wounds. Izuku's been getting better at it. He no longer faints at the sight of blood, like he would have at the start of the first year at UA. Since he started his second year, Recovery Girl had allowed him to sit in several surgeries at the nearby hospital. Not too many, but enough that Izuku can soak up the information and use it if an emergency will require. It hasn't yet, and Recovery Girl did tell him that it'd be years down the line before something like that happened, but that was beside the point. If Izuku had the sight and the knowledge, he could usually recreate what was going on. The door opened again, and Zuku turned around to greet whoever was entering. Well, it was just Recovery Girl. Kane surprisingly silent on the floor. She must have just gotten it tuned by one of the support students. She made her way to the desk and sat down, before she was swirling around in the chair and facing him, her normally cheery face serious. I'm leaving tonight, so you won't need to come in for your after-school sessions. Izuku tilted his head and pushed his glasses up his nose. Will Arata-san be there? Maybe I could shadow... She'll be accompanying me as well. Izuku, take a few days off. Recovery Girl smiled at him and swiveled in her chair. You need a break. Always running around trying to know more. Izuku felt his face flush red as he ducked his head to the side, pulling at his scrubs. I just want to be ready when the rest of the class becomes heroes. And I know this. Your quirk is a gift, but you must remember to rest both parts of it. The healing and the muscle memory may have you set up to fast-track into a skilled medic, but you still have the skills of a basic CNA or a paramedic. She reached into her pocket and pulled out an unopened bag of gummy worms. You were meant for greatness and heroic, Suzuku, but remember that even crab apples need time to ripen. Crab apples are poisonous, Izuku blurted out, and Recovery Girl just laughed and tossed the bag of candy at him. Go get changed and head back to the dorm, Sonny. I'll see you next week. Izuku didn't manage to catch the bag of gummy worms, but he did offer a smile as he walked out, signing off at the clipboard on the wall. Another hour, another step closer to becoming a doctor, a real hero just like everyone else. Midori Izuku, date of birth, July 15th, currently age 16, height 165 centimeters, hair color green, eye color green, quirk manifestation date, September 30th, age 7. Quirk. Miracle Medic. Quirk allows user to see medical procedures performed and then replicate them nearly perfectly through muscle memory and practice. Quirk also allows user to transfer their own stockpiled energy to injured persons via skin-to-skin -skin contact. This transfer of stockpiled energy works something like Recovery Girls, as it allows the receiver to heal at an accelerated rate. Differences include that the transfer does not drain the energy of the receiver. Energy transfer cannot regrow organs or limbs. That wouldn't be able to regenerate naturally. Two days later, Zuku's sitting under a tree with Uraraka and Ida, study guides and textbooks abandoned in a pile as they lay back on the grass and stare at the impossibly clear sky. Recovery Girl wasn't the only hero staff member gone for the next week. It was almost odd. Only Cementos and a retired hero were on campus, along with All Might, of course, but even the man made himself scarce. Much like Izuku's free period and after-school classes, heroics had been cancelled and any other subject that was taught by a hero had a sub. It was odd. Odd that Aizawa-sensei was gone, too, but Izuku really didn't think much of it. Probably just some big conference or something like that. Either way, no one seemed to be worried about it, so he wasn't. "'That cloud looks kind of like when Kaminari sneezes,' Uraraka said, pointing, and Izuku followed her finger, letting out a quiet laugh when he saw the cloud. Ida had also laughed, but... It quickly fell back into silence. It was peaceful. And then Izuku's phone went off, cheerily blasting the tune of one of All Might's cartoons that was discontinued a few years back, although Izuku would still argue to this day that it was the best Saturday morning cartoon. He'd even caught Shoji watching it once. He sat up and fumbled for the device, 
Noting that the number was unknown, Muraraka and Ida had also sat up, and they watched as Izuku answered. "'Hello? This is Midori Izuku. How can I help you?' Izuku said, and there was a sound on the other end. Maybe someone was in a car. "'Midori Izuku. That's the name.' Izuku shot a look at Ida, who looked confused as to why he answered the name question twice. "'Pack a bag and come to the front gates. Recovery Girl decided to have you come on an impromptu work-study.' The voice on the other end sounded official, but after one kidnapping scare back in his first year, Izuku wasn't ready to write it off so quickly. "'Really? What's her hero ID, then?' The voice rattled off the numbers, and, well, that was right, and it was the code that Recover Girl had given him. So Izuku thanked the voice, confirmed that he'd be out in fifteen minutes, and then hung up. "'Who was that?' Uraraka asked as Izuku began to gather his things and get up. He shrugged and offered her a gloved hand, which she took with a smile. Apparently I got approved for a quick work study, which is weird since, you know, it's almost the weekend and she'll be back tomorrow for classes, Zuku explained as they started to walk back to the dorms, arms full of papers and books. I don't know why she'd call me out so late, but the phone voice did give me all the right information for things like this. Well, I'm glad that you've gotten an extra opportunity for a work study like this, Ida interjected, his hands chopping. You were complaining earlier about being bored. They got to the doors, parted ways, and Izuku ran to his room, quickly changing from his normal clothes into scrubs, adding a jacket for outer protection before he was grabbing his quick night bag. Recovery Girl had drilled into him the importance of having a bag that you could just pick up and go with. Just something with a change of civilian clothing, some toiletries, his copied first aid notes, and a random fantasy book one of his classmates had shoved in as a joke. Recovery Girl's reasoning for the bag was that, as a healer, especially a hero one, You'd never know when you're called out suddenly and need to drop everything to go heal someone important. Izuku swung the backpack on and left the dorms without too much of a goodbye, just to yell to those who were still in the common area and Kachan in the kitchen. He'd be back tomorrow. Izuku wasn't going to be back for a while. He realized that when he saw that there was an armored car outside of UA, but when he tried to backtrack into the building, the doors on the back of the van swung open and a whole team of people in what reminded him of riot gear stepped out. Izuku got in the van. When he sat, there was a taller person on each side, almost boxing him in, and no one said anything until the doors were shut, and they'd already been moving for half an hour. The first person to speak was a rather severe-looking woman, whose blonde hair was pulled back into a ponytail that could just hear the migraine coming from. Apparently there was a war happening, and that's why all the teachers were gone. Izuku had been given exactly one minute to sit in silent shock before he was given the news that they were low on medics and had to call on the reserves of healers that weren't supposed to be there. Izuku had asked where Recovery Girl was. Was he going to be joining her as a field medic, or would he be working with someone else he'd talk to when he'd done internships and work studies? I'm sorry, but you won't be seeing Recovery Girl. He asked why. He got an answer. Izuku didn't even get to cry before they were rolling to a stop and the doors were being flung open. There was a bunch of cars, the air thick with heat and ash with decay, Recovery Girl's medic station was closest to the fighting. It was half a mile walk to get there, and Izuku couldn't remember any of it. "'I'm Azumi,' the woman stuck her hand out, but Izuku didn't shake it. He could see how badly she was shaking, eyes tightened with pain. "'I'm here to help you, Midori-san. "'Izuku,' he corrected before she could ask. He glanced at the wire that she was holding, how it went from cot to cot, and how the injured people were also holding on to it or at least touching it, some asleep, most staring at the top of the tent with glassy eyes. What are you doing? My quirk lets me disable pain receptors via electricity. The wire is conducting it since we ran out of medication for pain hours ago, Azumi explained in quick tones, her breathing labored more than it should be for a simple quirk. There had to be a drawback of sorts. It's hurting you, Izuku had said simply. All he got was a nod. He pulled off his glove and reached out for a second, tapping her cheek. His quirk flowed from him to her, giving the smallest boost of energy he could afford. Ozumi's breathing steadied for a moment. Thank you, Izuku. There was the sound of screaming, getting closer, and Izuku closed his eyes for one last second of peace. Maybe this was just a nightmare, a silly dream that he could wake up from. Maybe no one was dead. The screaming got louder. Izuku sucked in a deep breath and opened his eyes again, nodding determinedly at the other healer. Where's my workstation, and did Chio leave me any notes? Aizawa Shota was dead on his feet. Not literally, thank God, but the most recent wave of fighting had ended. After a grueling seven hours taking down villain after villain, trying to gain ground to where the League of Villains and the Liberation Front were camped out, 
It was nearly four in the afternoon, and as he trudged back to where he could rest, he vaguely wondered where Hisashi was. His husband had started the morning with him. They'd ran in together, but got separated somewhere along the way. A no moo being a bigger priority than keeping together. Shota's current goal was to get water, and then to start checking the medic stations. There were only five, so it'd be a quick work to confirm who was out of commission and who had gone down. Not for the first time in the past five days did he look up and think whoever was out there, that his students and the younger classes weren't here. Everyone over 18 and third year had been given a choice to fight, and Shota had watched in muted pain yesterday when a dead third year had been pulled out of a tent, already wrapped in a shroud to be placed with the other heroes and soldiers that had died. He'd taught Hanaki. He'd been powerful with a quirk that allowed him to extend root systems in a way that was amazing for capture, but the boy had taken a brutal thrashing from Anomu, and even the healers could only do so much, especially with the loss of Recovery Girl Sunday morning. The woman had stubbornly refused to stop giving care to the swell of injuries coming in, and she attempted to heal Mount Lady. She'd just succumbed to her quirk exhaustion and left them down one of their aces. Shota made it to a station where a medic was handing out water and doing quick body scans to check for internal bleeding. They gave Shota water with a grim look, eyes growing a faint pink before they were clearing a seven, a needing of medical attention, but advised to rest for the next wave. He thanked them, and then set off back to Recovery Girl's old tent. There were still healers working out of there, and Shota knew that it would probably be the first place Azashi would be if he was injured, due to it being the closest to the fighting. Heroes could get treated there, and then moved further in once they were stable. Shota entered the med tent, scanning over the rows of full cots, how there were heroes and soldiers alike there, a wire stringing between them, even if there weren't currently any healers in the tent. It was cold. Colder than he would have thought for a tent at the edge of a battlefield, but Shota just made his way through it scanning for Hisashi. He wasn't here, and the curtain at the back was opened a bit, so Shota glanced through. At the empty operating table that was used for emergency procedures, the curled-up body leaning against hastily set-up cabinets. Wait a minute. Midoriya? Shota whispered, and the body lifted their head. Midori was wrapped in a shock blanket, glasses tilted askew and green curls wilted with sweat and grease as the teen blearily blinked at him. "'Sensei, are you hurt?' Midori whispered back. His voice was completely groggy and shot. Shota was, but that was beside the point. Since his injuries weren't serious, he'd already been cleared by one of Endeavor's medics at the water station. Why on earth was his student fussing over him? Midori stood up and wobbled forward leaning against the operating table as he shed the shock blanket to reveal medical scrubs that were splattered with blood. "'What are you doing here?' Shota walked forward and closed the curtain behind him. "'You're supposed to be at UA.' "'Supposed to be, with the rest of Class 2A, because they were still children. Supposed to be back and not here, because everyone had agreed that it was far too early to introduce an entire war to literal minors.' Midori blinked at him, clearly confused. "'Recovery girl's gone, and they—' a deep, shuddering breath of exhaustion. Needed someone with a quirk like hers. How long have you been here? Midori glanced around, looking for a clock. When he saw the one that was hanging on the cabinet, he sighed again. It's Wednesday? Forty-three hours on my feet, if it is. I got here Sunday, I think. Oh, God, no. Shota reached out, careful to avoid making contact with Midori's skin. Have you been using your quirk this whole time? You're going to work yourself to death, kid. No, no. Did a field amputation a bit ago, and Najiri-chan lost an arm. It was too mangled for me to fix. I'm sorry. Midori tugged on the edge of his scrubs and closed his eyes for a moment. And there's a bit of a lull. I was just trying to get a nap before I do another round of healing out there. Shota shook his head. No, absolutely not. Midori didn't even try to fight him, just closed his eyes, a few tears leaking out. Okay, sensei. It's not because you're in trouble. Shota tacked on because Midoriya could get the wrong idea. It's because you shouldn't have been brought here. Especially not after Recovery Girl's death. Whoever had brought the healer here was going to pay. Midori barely had his healer's provisional license. He was not qualified in any way for frontline work. And 43 hours on his feet? Working himself to the bone? Most surgeons didn't take longer than 14 hours, and that was for major operations. The kinds where everything went wrong. Not to mention, they were likely standing in one place while Midoriya had probably been moving from the main area to his procedural room. Midoriya, you need to wrap yourself back in that blanket, okay? Shota moved around to the side of the operating table and picked the blanket off the ground, wrapping it around the shaking teen. Midoriya clung to the fabric like a lifeline, and his eyes fluttered shut, again under his glasses. 
I'm tired, he murmured and Shota gently lifted his student up, cradling him against his chest. Will everyone be okay? Yes. Shota walked out of the room, out to the main area. Those who were conscious and able to were silently watching as Shota took the young healer away. Shota made it to the edge of the tent. Midoriya's head lulled against his shoulder. There was a single clap behind them. Shota paused and turned to see that they were all staring, and in the back, Rocklock, with a wrapped chest and a head, was clapping slowly. Two more people joined. Only three claps from five people in a room of adults. "'Thank you, Midoriya Zuku,' a soldier spoke from the center, voice slow and melodic. "'Rest easy, and know you saved us.' Shota ignored the way that his eyes dripped, and he gave her a nod. "'He will. Rest easy.' He turned, still holding Midoriya, and left the tent. After that, running into Hizashi was easy, but they were going in different directions. Hizashi to go eat, Shota to go chew out the council that was spearheading this war effort. His husband did leave Midoriya with a gentle pat to his head, a slight brush of fingers through the green hair. The student had stirred at the touch, face twisted in something unreadable, but he'd settled by the time that Shota got to the tent where all the planning was going down. He gave a quick nod to Nezu before he was sitting at the table, Midoriya in his lap, still wrapped up in a shock blanket. Poor kid was probably in shock with how long he'd been going. Had he even been given a moment to process what had happened to his mentor? Or had he just been thrust into battle without time to grieve? Shota remembered his own losses. They had wiped him out for hours after, and Midoriya had seen Recovery Girl almost as a parental unit of sorts. That had to have been a blow to his gut. "'Why is a child here?' Shota said slowly as... A few hadn't noticed him yet, and he came in, and he boldly sat at the table and stopped talking. There was a moment of painful silence, and then Nezu was getting on the table, no trace of cheer on his face. "'I, too, am wondering how you managed to sneak a child here, especially after we put a vote to it and decided that Midoriya Suku should not be brought into this war.' Murmurs increased. "'We needed his quirk to preserve human life,' a burly man with a walrus tusk had spoken up. "'With all due respect, Nezu, not taken.' The walrus man just ignored it and continued. Midori's quirk and his medical knowledge was invaluable these past few hours. Shota pushed down a hiss. He's been here for four days, you bastard, not mere hours. I also thought that Midori was a Hail Mary move, someone said daintily, raising a blue hand, their face sent in hard lines. Mori-san agreed with Nezu and I, and yet the child is still here, and clearly overworked. A woman with a sleek ponytail stood and shook her head, pressing a palm to the table. We needed him, so I retrieved him. Midori agreed and came willingly. How much did he know? Was he aware that he was walking into a medical nightmare? The blue person shot back, and the walrus man looked away. This was taking too long. Shota didn't care who the hell supported this. He needed to get the healer out of here now, and before he became another recovery girl by using his quirk until he dropped dead from losing any of the stockpiled energy he had. Shota wrapped the blanket more securely around Midori before he was glaring at the panel of strategists. I'm taking him back to UA. He's been running a longer shift than any of the other medics here, and he needs sleep and food before you start forcing him to perform amputations on a battlefront again. He shot another glare when a woman tried to speak up. Midori isn't even qualified to be doing surgery without supervision in a stable and sterile setting, supervision that he doesn't have since his mentor died from quirk exhaustion. Midori mercifully didn't wake up from his sleep, even when Shota's voice rose a bit, shaking with anger. Eraserhead, our resources are exhausted, and we need you here in case the Liberation Front tries an ambush. Shota sighed and flipped off the protesting woman. And this sixteen-year-old has been on this shift for longer than Endeavor. He needs someone to know that he's taken care of, and take him out of here. You guys can last two hours without me, not to mention that the Liberation is undoubtedly exhausted as well. Fine, be quick, she relented at last. Thank you. Shota stood and scooped Midori up. I'll be back. You broke a bone, Recovery Girl was prodding at his leg, and Azuku felt an odd feeling down in there, as if she was pushing his shin back into place. Probably was. Yeah, Kirishima-kun accidentally kicked me while he was all rocky, Azuku laughed out sheepishly, and he got a sharp look in response. So reckless, you kids will give me a heart attack one of these days, Izuku shrugged. Then I'll get to wear the white coat. She smiled and swatted his uninjured leg. Don't be so excited to have me die, boy. I still have years left in me. And you don't get a white coat until I think you're ready. All right, all right, fair enough, Chiyo-sensei. Izuku smiled, and he laid back as she went back to putting his bones together. 
Mizuku woke up with tears on his face, in his head in Yayorozu's lap. Most of his body was on other people. His torso was in Jiro's, his legs were in Kachan's and Ojiro's laps as well. Midoriya-kun, Yayorozu said softly. It sounded like she'd been crying, and Mizuku reached out to wipe at her face, but his hand stopped, tangled in a blanket that smelled of blood and death. Oh. Chiyo-sensei, Mizuku murmured, and the people below him stiffened. She's not dead, right? A hand on his knee. Warmth. Probably Kachan. Nerd, you've been asleep for eighteen hours. We need to get you some food, okay? Izuku choked on tears, and he nodded, wanting to melt into sobbing as a gentle hand began to run through his crusty hair. Kachan lifted his legs and moved out from under him, walking away, and only then did Izuku realize that his glasses were missing. Glasses? He asked, and a moment later the familiar frames were sliding onto his face, and a straw was being placed in his mouth. He drank the water greedily, thankful for it. His throat was already feeling better, and when Kachan got back he was carefully helped up into a sitting position, a bowl held in his shaking hands as he spooned curry into his mouth. It was nice of Kachan not to give him chopsticks. Izuku didn't think he could keep his hands steady enough to properly hold them. One of Jiro's ear jacks was resting deceptively gentle on his neck, right next to a pulse point, and Izuku let it stay. He must have worried the hell out of the class, disappearing and somehow... How'd he get back? Last he remembered, he'd been scooping someone's acid-covered eye out with gloves on, apologizing as he did it without any painkillers for them because there just weren't any. How did I get back? He asked after a bite. Aizawa-sensei, Ojiro said quietly. He carried you in last night around 10 p.m., and we've been monitoring you in shifts since then. Did he... He told us about the fighting and where you came from. Jiro's ear jack shuddered, and he felt her wrap her arms around his waist, almost as if she was assuring herself that he was still there. Apparently the League has been demolished, nearly, and the fighting is expected to be done by Saturday. Oh. Izuku stared down at his bowl. Okay. Midori-kun, are you all right? Yayurozu asked, and Izuku shrugged. I need to shower. I think I smell like blood. It's itching me. I, I want it off. His breathing started to pick up as the memories started to bubble up and there was sweaty hands taking the bowl away, something soft replacing it. Izuku pulled at the softness gently, and he was vaguely aware that the ceramic bowl had probably been taken away because he could break it and hurt himself. At least Ojiro's tail was soft and grounding. The sensation of sticky blood was fading even though he could still smell it. "'Do you need some help getting clean?' Kachan asked, and Izuku nodded miserably. "'Okay. That's okay.' Kachan said, and his hand landed on Izuku's shoulder, smoothing out the scrubs. Me and Tail will help you, all right? You don't have to be alone for this. You can grieve. Izuku burst into tears again at the kindness. I don't understand my classmates. Izuku swung his legs, and Chiyo sensei didn't turn around. Izuku took this as an opportunity to continue, and he kept swinging his legs, even though he should be sitting at his desk next to recovery girls, rather than on the examination table. They're all so nice to me. Even 1B. I don't think I've ever been hugged this much in my life. She turned around and tutted. Well, of course they care for you, Midoriya. You're their healer. That's the only reason. No, but it is part of it. People like us. Our quirks only give. We can't take. Having someone whose quirk is just as selfless as them, they'd kill for you if it was needed. Izuku mulled this over, turning her words over in his head. I like having people care about me as much as I care for them. The teachers were back by Saturday. The infirmary remained closed, and there was a memorial held for the heroes that died in the fighting. For the soldiers that had gone in even though they knew that they weren't allowed to use their quirks. Seven third years had died, and Izuku left cherry blossoms at their memorials. He recognized one of them. They'd been a student who could make people dizzy with just looking. They had arrived in the tent with their vocal cords ripped out. Izuku hadn't been able to save them in time. He left roses at a few. Yue had been lucky to not lose any of their teacher heroes, just recovery girl, and she was labeled as part of the administrative staff. Her memorial was the last in the row. And although Izuku had been with most of the class when he'd stopped at each one, here they broke away to let Izuku stand alone with a bouquet of chrysanthemums. Chiyo-sensei had said they were her favorite flower, and Izuku didn't know why. He should have asked at some point. 
He knelt and placed them at the base of the memorial, not bothering to stand as he stared at the other flowers there. Riots of color and bright. The ribbons that were fluttering in the breeze and tied to every surface that was possible. Izuku reached out and took one, turning it over to read the words there. My hero, penned in a child's handwriting. Healers aren't often called heroes, no, even when Recovery Girl had the title as the youthful heroine, not many had acknowledged it, simply because it didn't seem like she was one according to conventional standards, but she'd saved whoever this child was. Izuku ran his fingers over the satin of the ribbon and then untied it, stuffing it in his pocket. His hand hit something metal. Izuku pulled a key out of his pocket. He could... He could go into her office, into their office. How had he forgotten? Izuku stood up and walked from the memorial, practically wandering to the infirmary. The door to the area was open, but their office was shut. And it was locked still, and the key slid home with a shiver of familiarity. And Izuku slowly pushed the door open to the dark office, only turning on half the lights as he shut the door behind him. Going through the drawers yielded the normal stuff he was used to, but when Izuku opened the cabinet above her computer... He was met with a wrapped package, his name and hero name written on it, in Chio sensei's neat and small handwriting. For Midori Izuku, the recovery hero, Asclepius. Izuku pulled it out and moved back to the examination table, climbing on with the package in his lap. There was a letter, taped to the top, and he opened it, already feeling his throat close up. Izuku, you earned this. I know that I left with little warning, and to something that you have no idea about, but I know that whether or not I do return, you've progressed in leaps and bounds as a trainee and a healer. No matter where you go now, or whatever you do, do it with passion and purpose. And stop breaking your bones in training. I'm not always going to be around to kiss it better. I care for you deeply, and thank you for letting me pass my wisdom onto you as a student. Anything I may not have taught you yet is stored in the notebooks in the safe. That is, in the closet. You already know the code. The world of hero healers is small, but I'm so glad that you joined it. Chiyo sensei Mizuku ripped away the wrapping, and then stared in shock at what was revealed. A few tears traced down his nose and hit the fabric, making it slightly see-through next to the layer of folded material. He stood up and slid on the white coat, straightened his shoulders and tilted his head up. It was a perfect fit, of course it was. Just a bit loose enough that Izuku could wear his hero costume under it if push came to shove. Yeah, he wasn't okay. Probably wouldn't be for a long time, and UA would need to adapt a rule to not having their main healer here. Student injuries would take longer to heal, and Izuku could only take so much time to stockpile his energy and give. He needed time to recover himself from the shit he'd seen, from the four days of hell he spent trying to pull people from the brink of death and war. No, Izuku wasn't okay yet but he'd figure it out. All right, everyone, this concludes the one-shot entitled Chrysanthemum and Crab Apple. Hope you guys enjoyed this one. This one's a little gut-wrenching sometimes. It's pretty sad at parts, but overall, it's a really good healer, Azuku fic. Anyways, I hope you guys did really enjoy this one, and as always, thank you all so much for listening.